for those of you who don't know me, my name's Wayne, Wayne Langdon, um, and uh, I'll be leading the service uh, this morning. And a little later, uh, Simon, our uh, minister, will be one of our ministers will be uh, speaking to us from God's Word. Let's just pray as we open up the service. Father God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that, you can, that we can gather as a group of your children, a group of your people, to hear from your word. Father, we just pray that uh, you and your name will be glorified through uh, the service and the things that are happening here today, Lord. Uh, Father, we just pray uh, that our, our hearts and our ears would be open to your word and uh, may we apply uh, your word to our lives. Father, we just pray these things in your name. Amen. So we're going to sing our first song, which will be up on the screen there, uh, Nothing But The Blood. Please stand. Simon's going to preach on the, the subject of the covenant promise. You see that on the front of your uh, bulletin there. Um, it amazes me that uh, when we see big sporting teams um, 
uh, big business, and a lot of times contracts or promises uh, are broken. Well, we worship a God who doesn't break uh, his promise, doesn't break his covenant. We're going to say a creed moment just to um, affirm who God really is, uh, the God that we worship, and the God that, uh, that doesn't break uh, his covenant promises. We're going to say together uh, the creed, we trust in God the Father, who has revealed his love and kindness to us and in his mercy saved us, not for any good deed of our own, but because he is merciful. We trust in Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us from our sin and set us apart for himself, a people eager to do good. We trust in the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out on us generously through Christ our Saviour, so that justified by grace, we might become heirs of eternal life. Amen. Uh, Kate's going to come up and read the scriptures for us, uh, including the passage from Genesis that will be uh, preached on later on. Good morning, everyone. The first reading today is going to be Psalm 83, verses 1 to 8, and you can find that on page 584 of the Church Bibles, Psalm 83, starting at verse 1. O God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet. O God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagrites, Jebal, Ammon and Amalek. Philistia with the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them to lend strength to the descendants of Lot. The next reading is Genesis chapter 9 from verse 1 to 17 and that can be found on page 8. Genesis chapter 9 from verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. So God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, boys and girls, this is uh, your time to uh, come down the front and uh, Mrs. Pass is going to uh, give you a bit of a story. All right, hello everybody, come on down, don't be shy. So good to see you today. Awesome. Okay, good to see you all, I hope you're well. Now boys and girls, we're gonna continue our story in the Bible of Noah. All right, I'm going to see what happens next. Now, everybody, because you did such a good job of involvement last week, I'm going to ask you to join in again today. So boys and girls and adults, when you hear me say, God is a promise maker, I want you to say, and a promise keeper. Okay? God is a promise maker, and you say, and God is a promise keeper. Shall we have a practice? Okay. Kids, you have to be the loudest. Are you ready? God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. Ah, so good. All right. Everything that he says will happen, happens. Now, God said that he would destroy the earth with a flood, and it happened. It rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. The whole earth was covered by water, just as God said. God said that he would save Noah and his family, and it happened. Noah and his family were safe on the ark. The rain stopped and they made it back on dry land, just as God said. God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. God then promised that he would never flood the world again. And God gave a sign to show this promise. And it's a sign we still see today. Does anyone know what that could be? A rainbow. Has anyone seen a rainbow this week? I have. Wow, what a timely time to do this passage. Well, every time we see a rainbow, we can be reminded that God would never flood the whole earth again. But wait a moment. Why would God make such a promise? After the flood, the world was new and different, but there was still sin in the world. People were still in the world. People would still make God sad and angry. Why would God keep his promise to not destroy the world with a flood? Does anyone know? Why would God keep his promise? Yeah. Because he's merciful. That's a good answer. Let's find out. Well, let's look at some of the other promises that God made to understand why. And remember, God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. Let's take a look at the promises God made to Abraham. There should be some pictures. Awesome. Well, God promised Abraham that he'd be the father of a great nation. But Abraham had no children. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were old. And Abraham and Sarah didn't always trust God's promise. But God kept his promise and gave them a son. And from one son, a great nation came. God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. Now God promised that Abraham and his family, the great nation, would have a land. But Abraham's family were trapped as slaves in Egypt. So God sent plagues, he parted the sea, and he rescued them from Egypt and brought them across the desert to the new land. But the people didn't trust that God would give them the land and they refused to go in. But 40 years later, God still gave them the land. 
God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. God promised Abraham that through his family, the whole world would be blessed. And Jesus was born from Abraham's family. God promised that a king would come from his family whose kingdom would never end. And in Isaiah, God said that this forever king is also a servant. I wonder if anyone knows who this forever king could be. Who do you think? Yeah, that's right, Jesus. God promised that this servant would come and suffer. He would die and he would set his people free. And so King Jesus came. He suffered and he died to set his people free from the punishment of their sins. Remember, God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. You see, children, God promised to never flood the world again. And God kept this promise, but not because of what the people did, but because of his love and kindness. God's love and kindness is his great rescue plan for Noah and his family. And God promised that he would send a servant king who would save us from our sins. And even though we deserve to be punished for our sins, God loves to save his people. God rescues us from our sin when we put our trust in Jesus. And remember, God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. How good is that? How about we pray and talk to our wonderful God now? Why don't you close your eyes? Wonderful God, thank you that you make and keep your promises, not because of what we do, but because of your love and kindness. And thank you that you promise to save everyone who puts their trust in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, time to head out for our time together. And everyone say hello to those around you. Morning, everybody. I wonder if you'd like to bow your heads with me. Now, Heavenly Father, um, I, we know that my words are mere sound in the wind, but through your Holy Spirit, uh, your words can touch us and change our lives. Um, teach us today something that might encourage and strengthen us for Jesus' sake. Amen. I, uh, during, during the week, I heard of a conversation um, so in response to everything that's been happening uh, in Australia at the moment and, of course, overseas, uh, in Europe in particular, a question was asked, uh, when will this apocalypse end? So how are you? Does that question describe how you're feeling at the moment? It's been a couple of bad years, hasn't it? There's bushfires and floods and drought and more floods and now there's a war and maybe even nuclear war. There's the ongoing effects of COVID as well. I mean, there's economic, social and emotional repercussions for all of it. And it doesn't feel like it's going to let up at any time, does it? So again, how are you? When will this apocalypse end? Now, having said that, of course, I'm not actually implying that we're in the apocalypse, um, but it, honestly, from my point of view, I don't think there's been a time in my lifetime um, when we've been bombarded with such um, tragedy and devastation in the world. But, of course, under the providence of God, this morning we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 9. We actually find ourselves in a part of the Bible uh, that maybe will give us some clarity about what's happening around us at the moment. So we're going to look at the passage today in three parts, at God's blessing firstly, then God's covenant, and then God's sign. And as we come back towards the end, um, hopefully we'll see 
how um, God's sign for Noah uh, is also a sign for us. So let's start then with God's blessing. Now, um, in Genesis 9, it opens with these words, And God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Those words actually indicate for us that we're coming to the near end of this story. We, we see in those words the beginning of a new creation that has followed the destruction of the flood. Um, and as the people exit the ark, uh, uh, God again blesses them with the command to fill the earth. Uh, th- this is God's blessing, and these words actually mimic two other occasions earlier in the book when God does, blesses, does bless the world with the command to be fruitful and fill the earth. Now, that phrase, uh, be fruitful and increase, is a little more, though, than just a blessing. It's actually, if you like, a statement of part of our creation purpose. So, if you like, God actually made us so that we could fill the earth, both plants and animals. So to be part of God's purpose uh, in the world... Humans and animals um, will fill the earth and that will help us to feast then in the sphere, if you like, of God's goodness. Now, there is a slight difference between um, chapter 9 and the previous two blessings. If you want to look them up, they're found in chapter 1, verse 28, and in 5, verse 2. But both of those blessings actually refer to a time before... Um, The fall. So they're referring to a sinless world. But now, once again, the world is being blessed with a new creation. Uh, We know, though, that it's not going to be exactly the same because sin has changed things and sin will continue to change things and that will affect the way that humans relate to the world and to each other. There are some obvious clues to that. One of them is in verse 2. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Um, Just a quick point um, of observation. We also read um, in verse 3, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that still has its lifeblood in it. As for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Uh, Just in case we forget, those words um, are a reminder to us that this is a new creation um, with respect for life. Now, I don't believe that those words imply that previously humans were not allowed to eat meat. There's actually no command anywhere, no ban on eating meat in the first eight chapters of Genesis. Instead, what I think it is, as we enter the new creation, that this is simply a reminder to Noah and his family that the giving and taking of life, including animal life, is actually the prerogative of God, not of us. Notice what it said about the animals. Animal life, all, sorry, all animals will be held to account for the life they take, um, but as well as us, and especially for us, the taking of a human life. That actually belongs to God and not to us because we were made in the image of God. So then the blessing that God gives people, we can sum it up like this, is the blessing of fruitfulness, uh, the blessing of life, not death, for God's purpose for us is not death but life in abundance. So that's the blessing. So what about God's covenant? From verse 8. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature 
that was with you. As you, I establish my covenant with you, never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So as we look at um, chapter eight, it's worth sorry chapter nine. It's worth paying attention to the order um, of events here. Um, we start with the blessing uh, to be fruitful and fill the earth, and notice that that's actually where it starts. It starts with God's action first. God's blessing or God's action always comes first, and the covenant follows God's blessing. That's always true when we come across um, God's word, uh, God's covenant. Now, the word establish or the word confirm here, which is another way of translating it, are really important ideas because it's actually implying that an agreement um, has already started. Um, And actually, it has. It's actually um, at God's initiative through blessing the world with the mere existence of life and human life. God has, if you like, built into the very fabric um, of creation um, his covenant with us by, simply by making us. Now, a covenant is, just, is essentially just an agreement struck between two people. Uh, usually one of the parties uh, is superior in power uh, and it is usually that party that establishes the covenant and that, of course, is the case here. In this case, though, the covenant... Um, already established, takes us back to the very existence of human beings. God in his mighty power has placed humans uh, in this vast and wondrous creation and by implication, God has blessed us and then we owe God um, for this blessing. So in Genesis 9, this initial covenant, if you like, is established or confirmed by God. Now, there's also something interesting else interesting to note here. The fact is that the covenant here is a covenant between Noah and his descendants and all living creatures. So notice the scope of this covenant, which is one of the clues why it's a creation covenant, um, because this actually shows us that God is committed to the whole of creation. It's not just committed to human beings, but to everything in creation. Yes, we do have a special place in the world. Um, We are made in God's image. There is no one else made in God's image. But God is committed to his whole order, not just to us. In fact, that's true when we know that in the New Testament we find that the new creation is the whole world as well as human beings made new. So there really is an intimacy, if you like, and a connection uh, between the whole of the created order and us as human beings. So then this covenant that's now confirmed or established should remind us um, just of the end part of chapter 8. God says there, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Those words, uh, once the people had left the ark, were intended to be words of assurance for Noah and his family. So they follow the flood, which has devastated the world. And then God says, as long as the seasons come and go, as long as day and night come and go, God says, I will never do this again. So now, at this point, God reminds Noah and his whole family and the whole of creation that they will be heirs of a new creation. Everyone and everything will benefit from this new creation. This is God's covenant or God's promise and it's a covenant of assurance. So then that leads us to the third thing and that is God's sign. And the story of the flood, of course, is brought to this Triumphant conclusion in verses 12 and 13, and God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between you, sorry, between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me 
and the earth. Now in the Bible, um, signs take different uh, forms. Some of them are miracles, um, and that's fairly an obvious sign. Others are what we might call coincidences or a chain of events um, leading up to a specific result. The important thing to realise about signs uh, is that they um, are appointed by God. So usually God takes something fairly ordinary um, and he makes it significant. And in doing that, he actually points us to God's plan or to some specific action um, that God will take in the world. Um, Signs usually uh, remind us of God's presence and our obligations. So let's take a stop sign as an example. Although it doesn't remind us of God's presence, um, it actually does remind us, doesn't it, of our obligations uh, to one another. If you go through a stop sign, you know what's going to actually happen if you hit another car. Perhaps that can also remind us of the presence of God because all life is precious to God. But this sign, if you like, the sign of the rainbow in this place reminds us of God's promise. In this case, the sign, the rainbow, refers us back to God and to his covenant. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but in this um, little section um, of Genesis, as God speaks, he, five times God states what he intends to do. And this repetition of establishing the covenant between him and all people and all of creation functions a little bit like capital letters or bold type, drawing our attention, notice, to what God will do for himself with this sign. You see, that sign of the rainbow is not primarily a sign for us, but it's actually a sign for God. Five times God reminds the people that the sign will remind him of his promise, his covenant with Noah and the creation. So the sign of the rainbow will repeatedly, continuously and long into the future Remind God of what he's promised. Now, of course, signs serve this secondary purpose for us. So, and in, doing, in seeing the sign, we actually get to the heart of the story and for, for us, the heart of the rainbow. So the sign of the rainbow suits God perp- God's purpose to remind um, himself of what he's promised, but also it has a purpose for us in that it reassures us. The rainbow is a very powerful symbol in the world, isn't it? Um, Before, it was uh, co-opted to reflect the diversity of sexualities. Uh, The rainbow had a very long history um, of hope. Uh, Do you know the story, of course, that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow if you can overcome the wiles of a wily leprechaun (laughs) at the end of the rainbow? Uh, When I was 11 or 12, um, I remember chasing a rainbow um, and and hoping to find the pot of gold at the end, but gave up when the rainbow ended up over the ocean. The rainbow has also been associated with the gateway to heaven or a path, if you like, for souls to transit between heaven and earth. However, you put all of that aside because it's in the promise of God that we find what might be or what is indeed for us a message of hope. You see, in Genesis 9, the rainbow illustrates for us the security and the hope that comes from God's promise. Despite Noah and his family and the world and humanity getting a new start, Despite the rainbow as, a, as signage of God's promises of judgment and of a restoration, a new creation, despite the rainbow being a sign that God is actually now holding back judgment for his time, for us, the rainbow is a sign of assurance. Let me help put this in perspective. See, chapter 8, the end of chapter 8, assures us that as the seasons go, God will 
take care of things. You won't do this again. And chapter 9 is actually doing something similar with this visible sign for us. Immediately after the flood, the world will actually go on as it did before the flood. We're reminded at the end of the chapter, chapter 8, that the fall has disturbed all of God's creation. We're reminded that the world is going to go on with the hearts of sinful people who are only sinful always from childhood. But the story also teaches us that God is withholding his judgment, that God will not visit the world with judgment like a flood, like he has. Seasons will come and go. Disasters will come and go. In fact, even when times seem impossibly bad, so that they might feel like an apocalypse. Even at the end of a flood that, by the way, doesn't consume the world, we can see a rainbow. The rainbow is a sign for us that what God says he will do. And God will do what he says. For generations of ages, for the farthest generations, the rainbow is a sign of peace between God and humans. God has spoken, and in the words that he promises for himself, he gives us the merest glimpse of a peace that has been initiated by him. Did you notice in in Genesis 9, the the rainbow doesn't have any of these mystical qualities or these mythical qualities that we see. It is simply a sign that God has initiated a peace with rebellious people. And here is God's pledge for the present and the future, that God will remember his words. So from where we stand, we are to remember his words. From where we stand, we're to remember a covenant in which God is generous when he speaks. We're to remember a covenant in which God's words are truthful and on which God sets the future. From where we stand, we're to remember a covenant that brings new life. And one in which, in in fact, redemption and new creation plays a central part. It seems silly to say it, but you know what's going on around us at the moment is not an apocalypse. It's not even close. But what we see, though it is in its own way a little bit strange, is the assurance that God is in control. God has said his word in his promises and they cannot be undone. We're not seeing an apocalypse. We're just simply seeing the world go on as God said it would. As seasons pass to season, as day passes to night and winter and summer and cold and heat pass from time to time. But we are seeing the certainty of the promises of God. His word is sure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. Unchanging are your words. When you have set your heart on human beings and on this creation, not to destroy it again with a flood. We know that your word is sure. We also know, Lord, that we see in the sign of the rainbow, the sign of peace, initiated by you, where you are withholding judgment. And we see in that the peace won for us, initiated by you through the Lord Jesus. Amen.
going to stand and we're going to uh, sing our next song. will be up on the screen. Your love, O Lord. Please be seated. <coughs> going to uh, have a time of confession and then it will be uh, uh, followed by, uh, by prayer. We're going to uh, say a, a confession together and to start off with I'll just uh, say just an introduction. Dear friends, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our sins and not to conceal them in the presence of God our Heavenly Father, but to confess them in a penitent and obedient heart, so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought always humbly to admit our sins before God, but chiefly uh, when we meet together to give thanks for the benefits we have received at his hands, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word, and to ask what is necessary for the body as well as the soul. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of our gracious God, and we pray together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against the divine majesty 
provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all the past and grant from time forward we may serve and please you in the newness of our life to honour the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jane is going to uh, pray for us. And then that'll be uh, following the prayers. Uh, Lisa is going to uh, come up and give the uh, mission uh, spot for today. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you worshipping you as creator, sustainer and redeemer of this world. We praise and thank you for your commitment to the whole of creation. We praise you for Jesus, that he lived a perfect life we could not live, died and rose again to take away our sin so that we could be right with you. We are so thankful. Thank you that we can be your children and come to you in prayer. We know that you made everything and control everything. We did not. We are struggling to understand the devastation and destruction brought by the conflict in Ukraine. We don't understand and we feel weak. We cry out with the psalmist, O oh God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O oh God, be not still. We thank you for the value you place on human life. We ask you to bring peace of mind and peace of spirit to those in Ukraine. We ask you to bring peace between Russia and Ukraine and end the hostility. Please remind our neighbours in Ukraine of your strength. Defend them and have mercy on them. Please be near to those who have stayed and those who have fled. We pray for the church in Ukraine and the church in Russia that you would be their strength, that they would faithfully trust you and continue to offer the hope of Jesus. Please give insight and discernment to our leaders and leaders globally, particularly European, American, Ukrainian and Russian leaders. Help them make decisions that will bring peace. We pray that they would turn to you for wisdom and that you would be gracious and give it to them. We pray for those affected by the flooding, particularly for the thousands of peoples whose homes have been completely inundated and those who have lost so much. We pray for calm and strength as people work out how to come out of this. We pray for your strength for those doing the rescue and clean up. We pray for those still waiting as waters rise. We pray for those processing the devastation and destruction, that they might know your comfort and your love. We pray for church families in these areas. Please give them your wisdom to know what to do and to help as best they can. We pray that they will be able to shine the light of the gospel into the lives of people whose current experience of life will be feeling very dark at this time. We particularly pray for leaders of these churches, that they might be holding to you and your word and that they might be a solid place in this devastating flood. We ask that you would use the conflict in Ukraine and the flooding here in our country to bring glory to your name. Help us to remember you are the King of Kings. Help us to be still and know that you are God. There is so much more we could bring before you, Father, and we know that you know all things, all the things on each of our hearts right now, and we pray today and ask that the Spirit would keep interceding for us as we cry out for your will to be done here. We know that what this world needs most of all is Jesus. We pray for us as Christians that through your strength we would be sharing the gospel clearly and truthfully and living it out, trusting in Jesus. We thank you that he has defeated death and that you will eventually make things right, including this broken world, reconciling all things in him. Thank you for the recent rain you have sent and for the beautiful rainbows that assure us that your words are certain and we can trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Jane, uh, just a, a few notices uh, which will be up on the on the screen. There, uh, going to uh, be holding a, a church um, working bee. It's in your uh, news sheet there. Uh, Saturday the twenty sixth. Um, so there's a list of jobs there: uh, pressure painting, uh, pressure cleaning bricks, um, uh, pre uh, pre preparing and, and painting the cloisters. Um, 
So there's a number of lists, number of things there. If you're able to help in any way, uh, details are there um, in your uh, uh, in your news sheet there. Okay, so that's uh, the 26th of March, uh, starting at 8 a.m. Uh, and there'll be uh, a morning tea break at, at, uh, at 10 a.m. Okay, now, Mr Waller is holding up a, a list up there, so if you're able to, to help, you can put your name on that, uh, on that list, and now Greg's got it. So, no excuse, it's been, um, you know, that there is a list up there that you can put your name on. Okay. Right. Uh, so there's a, yeah, a number of jobs here that need doing. Um, so if you're able to help in any way, um, please um, yeah, uh, make yourself available if you're able to. Um, now also um, uh, BCA uh, midweek luncheon, uh, which is Tuesday the 15th of March. The guest speaker will be uh, Mike Upton. Uh, there's details there. Uh, uh, 12 noon for a uh, 12.30 start in the potter's room. So bring your own um, packed lunch and RSVP. Uh, there's a, a list up the back of the uh, back of the church. And the topic, what is God up to in rural Australia? So it's a, um, a, a very appropriate um, topic for us. Um, now also uh, in uh, your new sheet there, uh, first aid helpers. So at the moment, um, we're compiling a, a, a list of uh, people who's happy to help with first aid uh, during church time and uh, when those activities on or organised, uh, on or off the property. Um, yeah, if you're able to, to help out anyway, you must have a current first aid certificate and safe, safe ministry training. Um, it's a, a good thing to do, so please let um, Simon or, or, or Helen know. Um, perhaps if you've got a, a first aid certificate, um, if you photocopy it and send it to the office, just so that people know who is actually qualified uh, to start off with, that would be that would be really good, um, and that would comply with a, a, a few things as well. So yeah, if you're able to help out anyway, let Simon or, or Helen know uh, in the office. Uh, yep, there's a number of other things in your in your bulletin. Um, just uh, what would really be a help to those who are uh, are leading services. If um, you're unable, unable to make it or unable to um, take part in the service that you're on on the roster, so for instance, if you're doing the Bible reading and you can't make it, um, just uh, be good if you could let uh, swap with somebody else. But also, if you do swap, if you could let the service leader know, that would be a help. Um, if you could uh, yeah, give the service leader a, a, a ring during the week or turn up 10 or 15 minutes early. Uh, just to uh, confirm with the service leader that you're able to um, able to uh, yeah, do your uh, job in, uh, in the service, that would be great. Okay, uh, and there's yeah, going to be new rosters um, uh, sent out very soon. Okay, so please take please take note of uh, of your new sheet. Uh, put it somewhere where uh, where you can where you can uh, uh, read it during the yeah, during the week. So, when you look at the rainbow, we see uh, a picture of, um, or a symbol of God's, God's promises. Now, I said earlier on that in business, in sport, we see so many times where people opt out of contracts, even out of relationships. Um, but God's promises are set in his word and uh, he won't break his promises. So, just uh, yeah, uh, take what Simon has, uh, uh, has said this morning and really, uh, yeah, think about that. Uh, we're going to sing our final song, and this would normally be our offering song, but um, uh, there is an offering box up, up the back. Uh, also, um, if you're able to uh, give online, you're able to do, do that as well. So uh, let's stand uh, and sing our final song, uh, which will be on the screen. Before the throne of God, please stand.
To everyone who has taken part in the service today, um, thank you for, uh, uh, for for the musos and for the guys up the back, and for everybody else who's taken part. Uh, it's great that we can all, all be involved. Uh, if you can take everything with you uh, following uh, the service, and we will have uh, morning tea out here. But let's close the service with a, uh, a couple of verses from the Book of Jude. Now, we'll glory to God who was able to keep you from falling away and bring you with. Uh, great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power and authority are his before all time and in his present and, and beyond all time. Amen. Please stay for morning tea.